Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz. Happy Halloween. And today I'm going to be talking about melatonin and ADHD, whether it's a good option for people to try. As usual, I'll start with the take home message. Um, I'll be talking for about 20, 25 minutes. And then if you have questions on this or other topics, I can try to answer them. So the take home message is three parts today. So melatonin, number of studies found it is effective, mildly effective for improving sleep, particularly increasing duration of sleep, slightly decreasing the latency to falling asleep or how quickly you fall asleep. Um, and that's been shown in people without ADHD and with people with ADHD. Um, number two, ADHD is very, very strongly associated with sleep disturbances. Some studies show as high as 90% and the best it's at least, the scenario is at least 80% of people with ADHD have significant sleep dysfunction and it's far away the commonest problems are phase delayed. So people are falling asleep later relative to the light dark cycle. And this isn't emphasized enough. I think it's not just a phase delay, but also, um, I guess what I'd call phase inconsistency or more or less stable, less consistent circadian rhythms. That's harder to study and takes much more work. And then three is that there are only a tiny number of studies specifically looking at melatonin use in children or adults with ADHD. And the studies we have suggest that, yes, external melatonin was able to change the internal clock timing. At least one study found decreased symptomatology of ADHD in a two week trial of external taking melatonin at night. But interestingly, several of the studies, even though they found changes in the markers of the internal clock, didn't actually show in that same study that there was an improvement in sleep. So that sort of turns things on its head that it may be other ways, other than just through a direct improvement in sleep, the melatonin leads to improvement in ADHD. Again, the data is sparse. So jumping into it, what is melatonin? Melatonin is what's called an indole amine that just describes its chemical structure. It's manufactured in humans and other mammals and throughout the animal kingdom. And we'll get to a moment from tryptophan, one of the basic amino acids, essential amino acids. Tryptophan in two chemical steps is turned into 5-hydroxytryptamine, 5-HT, which we know as serotonin. And a few more steps, it's, it can be serotonin can be converted into melatonin. In humans, and again, throughout the mammal, mammalian kingdom, as, as well as in many reptiles, birds, other, other animal species as well. The melatonin production is largely in the pineal gland, which is a one midline structure. It's one of the very few parts of the brain there aren't two of, one on each side. Um, and it seems to be primarily the mitochondria within the pineal, within the cells of the pineal gland that are making melatonin. What that indicates is that this is a very old chemical. So the mitochondria are thought to be descendants of bacteria that crept into other cells and are incorporated hundreds of millions or not a few billion years ago. Um, so this is very old and evolutionarily conserved molecule. And again, it was discovered, I think about 60 years ago now in animals found throughout the animal kingdom. And it took them several decades before it was discovered in plants. In plants, melatonin has very little to do apparently with circadian rhythms and seems to be much more there primarily as an antioxidant. And in the animals, it also works as an antioxidant. So it is both a direct, direct free radical scavenger, um, as well as being an agent that increases the synthesis of several antioxidant enzymes. So it's potently effective, more potent than vitamin E as an antioxidant. Other things that mel other actions melatonin has, that's that activates the immune system. 
it inhibits the molecule leptin and leptin is one of the important molecules for inhibiting hunger. The thought is that the inhibition of leptin, you would think if it were just simple direct inhibition of an inhibitor that melatonin would boost an appetite in eating, um, probably melatonin's effect is more a tonic ongoing effect and helping to regulate so that leptin levels aren't so readily subject to fluctuation. And when it gets to sleep, there are two different effects of melatonin. So one, it has both a chronobiologic effect. So it is working on, it is part of the clock's machinery, part of the internal clock's output to synchronize other clocks in the body, both for daily rhythms. And it seems important in at least many mammalian species. I think there's less certainty in humans in terms of measuring seasonal patterns or circannual rhythms. And melatonin is also directly a hypnotic or an agent that helps people fall asleep. Those are two separable and different properties. Um, so the enzymes that make melatonin are sensitive to light. So light suppresses the synthesis. So during the daytime, your pineal gland is not making melatonin. When the light starts dipping lower, there's what's called the dim light melatonin onset or DLMO. And with melatonin starts rising actually fairly rapidly in the normal humans, it reaches a peak level about two, two and a half hours after it first starts secrete, the pineal first starts secreting melatonin. And then it fairly steadily um, secretes melatonin for several hours and then usually shuts off before full light in the morning. The, the half-life of melatonin is only 20 to 40 minutes. So it is something that's degraded pretty quickly. So again, for it to be prompt for the really prominent amount of it in the body during the night, that means the, brain, the pineal gland is consistently producing it during that time. For people who have delayed sleep, phases or sleeping later, there, in many cases, the um, DLMO, dim light melatonin onset is occurring at a similar time, but there's actually a delay of about five hours rather than two to three hours before melatonin reaches its peak. Um, so in people with delayed sleep cycles, in general, most of the studies have found the secretion starting at the same time, but it's starting at a very low level for a few hours and then ramping up and then going. Studies going back, I think almost 20, 30 ago, suggest that dose, not suggest, found that dosages of melatonin in the 0.1 to 0.3 milligram range, most of the melatonin products I see on the market are anywhere from one to 10 milligrams, but a tenth of that as an oral dose in young healthy adults had physiologic effects on helping with sleep onset, um, helping with sleep duration, creating a subjective sense of grogginess and measurably decreasing vigilance on tests of vigilance. So dosages 10 times smaller than what we're using should be having at least some, whether that's primarily a chronobiologic effect or it sounds like both this hypnotic sedating effect as well, the dosage is much smaller than what we are frequently using, which brings in the question many people have pointed out that we use pretty high doses and people often will start with a one or two, three milligram dose. And if they're not seeing it sedating them as strongly as other agents they might want to be slammed into sleep with, then go to doses of five or 10 milligrams. Um, so lots of people have raised concerns are these big doses big compared to normal body physiology having negative impact. So in terms of immediate side effects, melatonin's pretty clean. So small numbers of people have headaches. This is kids or adults, feel some dizziness, feel some drowsiness, higher likelihood of bedwetting with kids taking melatonin. That's probably because they're sleeping more deeply. But the rates of headache, dizziness, drowsiness are actually not too dramatically different than the placebo group. So some mild effect there, but mild and usually transitory. Whereas the benefits of melatonin for sleep 
even kids or in adults do seem to persist even for people who are taking them three, four years. Um, but cumulatively, we're not seeing more dangerous side effects over years of taking it. So some of the other concerns are some of the early studies using melatonin to treat jet lag um, had depressed people, um, there were depressed people in the studies and that got noted in the results section and sort of copied over and over, oh, this melatonin could cause depression. I haven't found in any study trying to objectively look at, you know, how often are we causing depression? And there's a big body of evidence actually that melatonin is an effective antidepressant. And in Europe and not in America, agomelatine, which acts directly on a melatonin receptor is an effective um, um, prescribed antidepressant. So lots of, again, studies repeat things and, and this is how things happen in the medical literature. It shows up once and everyone's afraid if they don't include it and someone has a bad outcome, they could get sued. So I think it's more cover your ass medicine than good quality science linking melatonin to causing depression. There's also been worries since I mentioned in brief passing that melatonin can boost the immune system. And that raises a question in people who have autoimmune problems like lupus or even diabetes type, whether melatonin could have a dangerous effect by boosting the immune system. Theoretically, that's a possibility. Although again, I've tried looking and I have not found any documentation that there are any such real risks in the real world. And then the third big concern or, or commonly cited concern is that we know that melatonin has some impact on the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And the concern was whether kids who are on doses of melatonin might have delayed puberty. Some other people thought they might have early puberty. And again, when that's been systematically looked for, that doesn't seem to be a common problem, even on kids who are on this for years. Um, maybe in isolated cases, that may be an issue. Maybe not. Um, many of the conditions, many of the kids who are already having sleep problems and on melatonin have other conditions which also may predispose them to changes in timing of puberty. So aside from those side effects, one other point to be made of is that the use of melatonin for sleep has skyrocketed in the US particularly, but also risen considerably in Europe in the last 10 to 15 years. And in the US since about 1920, or 2020, that dates me, 20 or 2021, the number one most common substance reported to poison control centers um, for overdosing or potential, you know, call my kids swallow these pills or gummies, what do I do, is melatonin. Now that makes up less than 5% of the total calls, but it is the number one reason now for calling poison control centers. And, in, and the majority of these are ingestion of gummies, so that looks like a little kid to candies. The majority of the kids are boys who are less than five years old. So it is probably not kids who are taking it already for sleep. It's probably kids stumbling across mom or dad's supply and again, the kids candy. And this is not completely trivial. So even though more than 85% of the cases, there were no serious issues, there were problems in others. And there have been at least two deaths associated with massive overdose of melatonin. Now, to put that in perspective, if you drink too much water, that can kill you too. So this is not at all a highly deadly substance, but it's not completely, completely safe otherwise. Um, so jumping back or jumping more to, we do have a number of studies looking at kids with ADHD and showing that sleep can be improved with melatonin, usually doses of one to three milligrams or, or even lower than that have, have been studied. Usually the impacts on sleep are pretty small. So 10 minutes or less decrease in the time to falling asleep, a half hour or less increase in sleep. 
those results are actually not that widely different from the results of many pharmaceutical controlled substance medications that are sold for sleep, which again, statistically significant findings, many people clinically have an appreciably better effect. But if you look at concrete measurements of sleep parameters, it looks like a tiny, pretty small effect, but statistically significant. And again, clearly clinically meaningful. So what, there's only one study that I've been able to find, and they've actually been able to get three or four published studies out of this one study. It's by a Van Andel and her colleagues at, in the Netherlands that looked at 51 adults and divided them into all with ADHD, three different treatment groups. One group had a half milligram of melatonin. That melatonin was delivered initially three hours before the DLML, so before your normal body's secreting melatonin at night in attempt to move potentially delayed sleep individuals or others to an earlier time and to a more consistent time. That's group number one. Group number two had a placebo given at the same time. I, I should jump back. So the melatonin group, this was a three week study. First week, it's three hours earlier than the baseline DLMO. Second week, they moved it up another hour, four hours earlier, and third week, it's five hours earlier. And then there was a third group that got that exact same melatonin treatment and also got bright light therapy early in the morning. Unfortunately, they did it at the same time every morning, um, which may have curtailed the available time to sleep, um, but the attempt, from winter depression studies and other protocols where melatonin at nighttime and bright lights in the morning both together work synergistically to move the internal clock more quickly and powerfully. So in these studies, this study in particular, they did demonstrate that the DLMO was shifted earlier and it was shifted significantly more by the dual treatment group than just by melatonin, but melatonin had a significant earlier shift than the placebo group, which didn't have a statistically significant shift at all. Um, and in the ADD group, there was a 14% decrease in ADHD symptoms compared to the placebo group. And curiously in their own baseline and curiously the double treatment group did not get show any clear-cut statistical improvement in ADHD. And a follow-up analysis of some of the sleep data showed that even though the internal clock is measured by DM, as DLMO was shifting, that there wasn't any statistically significant improvement in sleep parameters. So sleep didn't start earlier, sleep did not was not more efficient, it didn't last longer, they didn't get more total sleep. Now, they were again measuring it just at the end of two weeks of treatment. The studies, which again show melatonin can improve those very same sleep parameters that weren't show here, um, those are usually a month or longer. So it might be that both longer and more consistent treatment of melatonin does produce more changes in sleep. But the very interesting conclusion, which the, the authors have not particularly jumped to, is that, I mean, the assumption up until now is that melatonin is helping with ADHD because it helps improve sleep. But again, they found an improvement in ADHD without an improvement in sleep parameters. There have been other groups that have been arguing for a long time that maybe the basic biological issue with, with ADHD is a desynchronization or clock problem. And again, so it may be that melatonin is having more chronobiologic benefits for ADHD than it is actually having hypnotic sleep direct benefits. We need much more data because we were, were extrapolating from one very small study. Um, there was a study published this year in kids with the melatonin treatment and ADHD but they, and, and showing again at the end of a month, 
those kids did show slight improvements in sleep, but that study didn't look at any improvement in ADHD variables. So the bottom line is it should be safe. I would recommend using dosages closer to one or two milligrams rather than higher doses. And again, I might have skipped this completely. If I said this, I am blanking out completely. So, so one of the other really important things is in a, I think it was a JAMA study in 2023, a respected medical journal. They surveyed a whole bunch of melatonin products out there. And what they found was that only 10% or only 12%, only 12% of the products out there were within 10% plus or minus of what the package said it contained. So many of the packages contained lower doses of melatonin, some of them as low as only three quarters of what was on the label, but many included much higher doses. And in this assessment, doses as high as 347%, so three and a half times what you thought you were getting from the label. The important thing, and this was, they surveyed a number of products, is this is completely consistent with every study I've seen, including consumer report studies going back 30 years, um, where compared to any other supplement I'm aware of out there, they are getting the dosages of melatonin wildly wrong. And not just surprisingly that, it's not just that they're under giving, under giving you too little, very frequently they're giving too much. Now, I don't know why it's so difficult to formulate the melatonin. I mean, maybe it's tied into its short half-life and they're counting on that or buffering or giving you extra because of that. I, I don't know why, but I've been keeping an eye on this again for 30 years. This is, so if you find a product that works for you, I would stick with that specific product because someone else's one milligram may be not at all with comparable to the one milligram you're already getting. So have a happy Halloween, stay healthy and happy. And I see there are a bunch of questions, so I will jump to them right now. And if I mispronounce your handles, sorry. So Scooties1983 says, Andrew Huberman has stated in his podcast that he strongly advises against melatonin supplementation for kids due to its suppression of the onset of puberty. Are there merits to this claim? Again, there is reason to be concerned, but there are at least four or five studies that looked at melatonin use for three or four years in kids and have not found any consistent problems with it. There were some case reports written up of kids who were happening to be on melatonin who had delayed puberty. Again, those kids already had other conditions, which I would argue would be a much more likely explanation given that the, the lack of finding this issue, which people are alerted to in studies that have been specifically trying to look for it. So my kids are 20 now, or twins. Um, so I did not get it. They didn't particularly have sleep problems, but I would feel much safer giving them melatonin than I would giving them Ambien or many of the other agents out there. Maybe I would be comfortable with the Dora agents. I do have a talk on those agents in this series. So that's what I would say. Dennis, hi Dennis. Um, can exogenous melatonin downregulate its own synthesis after prolonging continuous use? Great question. And that's one of the things I was meaning to address and I did not. It certainly could be possible. And so, so the question is giving melatonin from an external source. So that's, that's what exogenous melatonin means. Could it shut down the body's own ability, the pineal gland's own ability to either regulate or even produce melatonin after years and years? That's a concern. It's certainly something we see with other hormonal systems. I did not specifically look to see, for, look for studies trying to test that. But again, from what I was, what I was finding, I haven't found any direct evidence that that's actually been the case. So 
So June L says, I use a plant-based low dose one on Amazon. Um, and she heard that that was the best one because it's natural. I, so, so I don't wanna disrupt too many people's belief systems or value systems. If it's the melatonin molecule, it's the same identical molecule, whether a plant, a bacteria, a cow, or a human is making it. There, there isn't a chemical structure is the chemical structure. Whether there are different problems in the production of it, whether there are different contaminants in it, um, that may well be an issue. So I, again, the plant molecule melatonin is the exact same one. It should be having the same effects. And if it's working for you and meets with your ethics and values, great. Um, so Herman Musimbi asks, there was a study of melatonergic drug have called you know, agomelatin and ADHD. It's small, but there's a positive effect on the ADHD symptoms. So should clinicians consider combining agomelatine with stimulants? Um, so agomelatine, my recollection, there's two major melatonin receptors. Um, agomelatine is primarily acting on one and I'm not remembering it's M1 or M2. I think it's highly unlikely to be dangerous. Um, I don't know of any specific advantage of trying agomelatine over melatonin itself. And I'm aware that even though in the US, melatonin is an over-the-counter over product that's not controlled in any way. Um, I know in many European countries in Australia, in Australia, I think it's until you're 55 years old, it's prescription only, but above that, it's not. So. I think in many, certainly in the US, melatonin itself is more readily available and probably substantially cheaper. Whether you might argue agomelatin is you're more consistently getting an exact precise product, that may be true. And I don't know in terms of agomelatin dosing, how comparable that is to physiologic levels of melatonin in the night. So that would be an interesting question. Um, so I will try to find that agomelatine study because I did not find it doing my research for this. So I need to go back on. So, and Herman asked me, could I do a video on treatments or medications for ADHD that I think should be studied for ADHD? Um, so he's citing a study by Posi in 2021 yeah, so, I mean, they're increasingly bringing, there are new ADHD drugs in the pipeline or some of them like Kelbri, which got released a few, just a few years ago, old drugs, which are being repurposed. Again, I think there are things out there like Wellbutrin and Duloxetine that are substantially better for many individuals than Stratera Atomoxetine. So I will, check out that article and see if there are different classes of agents that I haven't looked at. Um, so there is a dopamine and norepinephrine drug on the market, reuptake inhibitor Sonosi. Um, I'm gonna butcher its generic name, Sol. Yeah. Don't have it in front of me and don't say it off enough. That they are on stage three trials for approval for ADHD and there, there have been extensive small studies looking at it indicating it's likely to be effective. Again, whether it's gonna be any more powerful or significant than Wellbutrin, Bupropion, I don't know yet. So Tabitha Hunter said, melatonin changed my life. Is there a brand dose you like best? So I, my simple answer is no. Um, I know people have their favorites and, and one of the other things getting back to the natural issue. Many of the people who like supplements and don't like big pharma think that they're sort of fighting the system or fighting the man. One of the things to be aware of is many, many of the supplement companies are subsidiaries or are owned by big pharma drug companies, not all. And again, I don't think that inherently makes them bad or evil. 
Um, but again, my message would be if you found something that's working for you, I would stay with that specific brand, even if it's really, a, you know, if it's, it's working for you, there's so much inconsistency in this field. I would keep with that. Yeah, so Tabitha also asks, are there any studies of ADHD and magnesium, L3 and 8? Um, I do have a talk on magnesium. It's probably a year and a half to two years old in this. And again, it will be in the, not the live section, but the video section of my channel with YouTube. You can't combine it once it's in. So I have one channel, but if you're only looking at the live videos, so just Google, I think magnesium, I think I also talked about zinc and copper in that. So there is some evidence that in some individuals, magnesium can be helpful and fairly quickly helpful, whether those are individuals who may have been low in magnesium to begin with or not, is not clear. Um, and it recommended dosages, it's unlikely to be harmful. The individuals I've worked with who've had benefits from magnesium and several of them felt that it was quite a substantial benefit for them, usually noticed it within the first week of taking it and sometimes within just a few days. And most of them took it at nighttime. Um, so I don't have the dosages at the top of my head, but I, again, I do have a video on that on this channel. So thanks for all the questions. They were interesting and good, and you've given me some things to be looking up and researching more thoroughly for the future. I will have this schedule for November out in a few days and yeah, I will be, as far as I know, I think one of those weeks I may have pre-recorded or it will be at a different time. So two weeks from now, I won't be available at this regular time I've been broadcasting at. So enjoy your ticker teeting and have fun, stay safe, stay be well, and I'll be back next week.